Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our fifth in our disability justice series um, here at ERCO. Tonight's topic is advocating and legislation for disability justice. Buenos, buenas noches a todos. Eh, gracias aquí por estar aquí con nosotros hoy día con ILCO y hoy día la, la, el tema de hoy día va a ser abogacía y legislación para la justicia de la discapacidad. Um, so I'm just going to start with a little bit of rundown on how to um, access um, things on Zoom at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to have a live transcript, you can also view the full transcript by clicking the CC at the bottom. Como ustedes pueden mirar, estos son algunas este, de las instrucciones de cómo ustedes pueden mirar, por ejemplo, en live transcript, ustedes pueden ver en la parte de abajo de la pantalla, está con CC. And we are also providing um, Spanish interpretation tonight, as well as ASL. You can access those by clicking um, the, the globe sign at the bottom and choosing the Spanish interpretation. Y nosotros también hoy día vamos a proveer interpretación en español y de ESL. Y ustedes pueden apretar en la, donde está el mapa mundi. Ustedes pueden presionar ahí y pueden buscar el idioma de su preferencia. And I want to um, thank our interpreters today for sharing their time with us. Um, we have Talia and Maria in Spanish. And for our ASL, we have Tara, Andrea, um, and we'll be also joined by Crystal later in the presentation. Y quiero agradecer a Boy Día para todos los intérpretes. Tenemos intérprete en español, a Talia y a Maria, y tenemos a ESL, a Tara, Andrea, y Crystal, que va a estar en un momento más. All right, and thank you so much. We will now be putting, Talia will be moving you over to the channel. So if folks um, who would like the Spanish uh, interpretation to join that channel as well. Thank you. Okay, okay. Entonces las personas que necesitan la interpretación pueden moverla a ese canal para estar disponible la interpretación. And here at ERCO, um, at our Pacific Islander and Asian Family Center, we like to begin all of our meetings with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that our place of community gathering, service, and home rests on the traditional ancestral lands of the Multnomah, Wasco, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Cowlitz bands of the Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, and Molava, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. We acknowledge that the U.S. was built by stolen African people on stolen indigenous land, occupied by colonists and settlers, and its indigenous people displaced. As immigrants, refugees, asylees, settlers, and guests, we honor the diverse native tribal communities in our region and offer respect for their strength, resiliency, and care of these lands throughout the generations to allow us to reside in it today. We give gratitude and share in the struggle and fight for collective liberation with our indigenous communities. And now I'd like to pass it off. Oh, pardon me. I, for our agenda this evening, we have our welcoming. Um, something has changed a little bit about this. We are actually gonna be start with our local organizing portion and then have a Q and A, and then we'll move on to our national organizing position uh, portion. And then, um, and then have time for a brief closing at the end. And I will now pass it off to Brina. Thanks so much, Amelia. Um, all right, so we always like to start off um, by also including some community agreements about this, the space as well. And so our first one here is take space, make space. This space is, is for all of us. Please take the opportunity to contribute to discussions and ask questions. Also be mindful if you're taking up a lot of time and allow others to have a chance to contribute. So that, that part um, applies for the Q&A session that we'll have um, later tonight after each presentation. And also stay engaged during virtual times. We acknowledge that folks have all sorts of things going on in their spaces, um, but please find a way to stay involved with the presentation, but also take care of yourself and do what you need to do for yourself while listening in. 
We always welcome input and feedback on how to make events more accessible. Confidentiality. Take the lessons of what you hear today, but do not share the story. Unless you have permission, please do not share any information or stories about folks in the workshop. We all depend on each other for safety and trust. Impact over intent. We acknowledge that things that are said or done may be done with good intentions, but if it is received as a negative impact, we want to own up to that and take responsibility. Please do let us know if you have any feedback for us. We're all learners in the space and agree to take the feedback we receive to make improved spaces for us all. And then we also wanted to acknowledge our Disability Justice Series curators. This was a group that came together um, before, well, to, to help us set up the whole series to begin with. And so we just want to recognize the folks who, who contributed to make this series happen. So we have Saron Tedda, Alamami Kante, Nadia Shere, Vailua Poretesano, Saba Gurgis, Tosin Abiodan, and Monica Diaz. We also want to take time to introduce our team here. So we have uh, our two departments, the ERCO Disability Legal Services and ERCO Community Development. We have um, Amelia Anderson, um, who is the ERCO Managing Attorney for ERCO Disability Legal Services. And we also have Alex Riedlinger, who is the ERCO Policy Advocacy Coordinator and Community Organizer. And, we, and then also myself, um, the ERCO Pacific Islander and Asian Community and Civic Engagement Coordinator. And uh, just uh, I wanted to also introduce myself as um, and how I present um, in that uh, I am a I'm Vietnamese Mexican um, and I also uh, appear more Asian and I have shorter hair and um, have a, a Mexico flag in my background and is, is something that we like to do to kind of help introduce ourselves and um, how we visually appear to folks who might be listening in. And I'll pass it off to um, Amelia to also do the same thing. Thank you, Brina. I am a white cisgendered woman in her mid thirties with um, curlyish brown hair, wearing glasses and white um, headphones, and a black sweater. Um, I also identify as queer and a person with a disability. Um, and I will pass it off to Alex. Hi all, um, Alex Friedlinger. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm the policy advocacy coordinator for our uh, community development team. And as far as my physical appearance, um, I am a lighter skinned black person with thinning um, brown hair and a short beard. Um, I also identify as a person with a disability um, and a, person, a queer person of color. Thank you. Thank you, team. And now we will um, go off for our first presentation for the day. Um, so I, I'm really excited to introduce um, Paul Turdal. Um, I had to use the spotlight there. And uh, this is the introduction you, some of y'all might have seen already. Um, but um, Paul Turdal is the son of refugee and a husband of immigrants. For the past decade, he has worked with the state of Oregon to pass laws and adopt regulations to improve support for individuals with disabilities. Paul would discuss strategies and lessons learned on how anyone could work with the government to improve public policy and make change happen. So without further ado, I'll pass it on off to you, Paul. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Great, thank you. Uh, so yeah, again, my name is Paul Turdall and I am a middle-aged uh, you know, white man with sort of brownish hair and blue eyes. Um, the, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, where did, what am I doing? All right, let me see if I can. All right, there we go. <clears throat> So um, yeah, again, thank you, thank you for the introduction. So I 
um, have for the last decade or so done a lot of work in the state of Oregon on passing laws and adopting regulations mostly related to support for individuals with disabilities. Um, my wife is an immigrant from Ukraine, and so I have also worked with her in the Ukrainian community on uh, legislation related to uh, the, the Holodomor from the 1930s. Um, and in addition to legislation, I've also worked uh, with uh, various government agencies on things like um, uh, rules for the mental health parity statute and implementation, as well as uh, you know, things that are covered in Medicaid. And I think part of the theme that I, that I want to give is, you know, I think one is anybody, literally anybody can get involved and really drive change. Um, you know, you, you, you know, the, the government is open to you and they, they actually do want to hear from you and work with you. The other is, you know, I have personally written and helped pass, I think, seven different laws in Oregon now. And that is one way of getting things done. But it's not the only way. There are, there are lots of different ways to, to get results. And so what I want to do is basically walk through a case study of one of the, the first things that I worked on which sort of describes both the challenges of working through this as well as the opportunities and, and, and what we can do. Uh, so let me go ahead and get into that. <clears throat> so about 10 or so years ago, I worked on uh, health insurance coverage for individuals with autism. So autism spectrum disorder is broadly character, it's a, developmental disorder that is uh, it begins in you know for young children it's broadly characterized by challenges of social skills repetitive behavior you know um, you know frequently issues with speech and, and nonverbal communication the impact on individuals can be very wide uh, for you know some the impact is minor and they may go through most of their lives without realizing that, that uh, they have been impacted by autism. For others, it can be completely debilitating. Uh, and yeah, I was motivated by my own children, uh, one of whom basically lost his ability to speak. You know, he began speaking normally as a child and basically went completely nonverbal as a, as a toddler. That was very concerning for us. Um, the, what we, we found back in, a dozen years ago is on the one hand our doctors were telling us hey you know this is treatable you really need 10 20 to 40 hours of intensive therapy every single week you know right away to turn things around and that was the standard of care we were hearing consistently but what insurance plans and, and medicaid and organ recovering basically nothing essentially 12 hours of speech or occupational therapy lifetime period and there's a big difference between 12 hours lifetime and 20 to 40 hours per week. And as I got into this, I found on the one hand that there were already laws in Oregon, including the mental health parity law and, a, and a, an autism specific law that did require coverage for these kinds of therapies, but they weren't really being complied with and they, they simply weren't being enforced by the government. Part of that is because perhaps the laws weren't very clear and part of it is, uh, I mean, to be blunt, the insurance industry has a very good relationship with their government and they, they didn't want the law to be enforced. Um, so, you know, I basically began working on multiple channels to, to address this. So one of them was going to the legislature and say, hey, can we clear up this law and make it more specific? The other was working through the insurance commissioner and and others to try to get the laws that we already have enforced. And basically had to do this all simultaneously. A, a key lesson learned, I learned very quickly, is that Oregon's political culture really loves collaboration and consensus. Legislators don't generally want to move a bill unless all of the stakeholders involved are in complete agreement. That means that as we were asking the the, the laws for insurance to be changed, we had to get the insurance industry to agree with us to change it. Um, you know, we had, and you know, we, and uh, along with that, you know, boards and commissions and committees the government appoints generally are appointed with people that the government can count on to collaborate and compromise and, and not rock the boat. 
And you know, there are good things there. We, you know, I think it, it's good to have a collaborative collegial environment, but there are problems because it means, you know, as I said, you know, the boat doesn't get rocked. Um, people who are really passionate and committed tend to get just shut out and excluded from these committees altogether. And there is frankly a lot of bullying for people who come in uh, with, with different ideas. And this, this is a challenge and, and difficult to work with. So the, the approach that um, we took is, you know, I, I use the nickname Heavy Kinetic from a, a presentation I was at years ago. The basic approach is to use every legal means at our disposal at the same time. So we worked on legislation, we worked on litigation and courts, we worked on administrative appeals, we worked on administrative complaints to government agencies, we worked with grassroots organizing, and we worked with the news media to, to get our message out. And I particularly like this picture because this picture shows a mouse <clears throat> eating its way through a maze. <clears throat> and as a private citizen working in the Capitol, that's basically what I am. I'm a mouse. I'm a mouse in a den of lions. Uh, the people that I'm working with <clears throat> representing billion dollar corporations all have vastly more power and influence than, than I have or, or than any of you would have. But you can do a lot as a mouse. Um, you know, you can, you know, and you, but there's a lot you can get done. And frankly, the, those lions are afraid of the mice. Uh, they are afraid of people like us. Uh, and it, so what we, we did working through this process, um, you know, we, we tried to get the laws enforced. As I said, you know, I wrote here, civil obedience, we follow the law and we ask other people to follow it too. So, you know, we began, I'm going to just go through some of these slides very quickly. You know, what we did is we began by, you know, as we were having issues getting new laws passed, we worked very hard to get the laws that we already had enforced. Uh, there are, with insurance, we found procedures we could use to appeal denials of insurance coverage that we thought were, were wrong. And we, we worked through those processes and you know, we, the first one back in 2007 before I was involved was successful. And we went to the insurance commissioner, my, my colleagues went to the insurance commission and said, hey, great, see, we got this. We were successful here in getting this through. Shouldn't you do this for everybody? And then maybe, but they didn't really do anything. So we, we went back and did an organized campaign where we rounded up, uh, basically we did outreach to families and basically what, educated families on how to go through the same appeals process that we did, which involves the government appointing an outside medical expert to make a binding legal decision about health coverage. And you know, we went through, I think there are about 15 or 20 on this list. We won essentially every time <clears throat> by going through this process. And by doing that first, all of these, these kids and their families were helped you know, by getting the coverage that they needed. But it also sent a message to the insurance commissioner and the government that maybe we actually knew what we were doing and that we should be paid attention to. Now, in California, my friends in California did something very similar. And when they got results like ours, the insurance commissioner stepped up and issued a declaration saying, that's enough. You cannot continue denying insurers. You must start covering the therapy now. That's over. It's proven. We don't need to see any more. That's what we wanted Oregon's insurance commissioner to do. But that's not what happened. Uh, Oregon's insurance commissioner instead commissioned a white paper from the staff to justify doing nothing. Uh, what you're seeing here are some internal documents that I obtained through public records request in which the staff basically was saying, um, you know, how do we explain to people why we're not doing anything? Not should we do something? What should we do? But how could we explain to the public why we are doing nothing? <clears throat> and so they commissioned the white paper, they wrote a white paper giving ideas for why to do something. And I'll just post something in one of the staff, quote, I recognize an answer like there are political barriers is not satisfying. So I'll try to find a better one. So we kept pushing, uh, and you know, again, you, you saw that long list of, of things we won. And even without the insurance commissioner taking action, Kaiser Permanente did. They basically said, okay, we get it. We have 
we have lost so many of these appeals, we should just provide coverage. And so now we had Kaiser Permanente going to the insurance commissioner saying, hey, we're gonna do this. Can you please persuade the other insurers to do it too? So we turned essentially an opponent into an, an ally to, to push with us. Providence Insurance Plan, on the other hand, uh, became very aggressive and we decided to pick a fight. Uh, so this is a, a insurance denial that uh, someone received 10 years ago, basically saying, because the services you want are related to autism, they're not going to be covered, period. Mm -hmm. That was the only reason they gave, because it's about autism, it's not covered. <clears throat> but the thing is, we already had a law in the insurance code directly requiring insurance plans to cover autism. So I, you know, the, the top up here, I have, you know, the, the quote from what they said for the reason for denial, because we exclude services related to developmental disabilities, developmental delays, learning disabilities, and autism. And yet here we have a statute that directly says you must cover autism, developmental delays, and developmental disabilities, directly in violation of the statute. And, and beyond that, they knew that was illegal. So what I'm quoting from here are internal documents. So the top one is a legal submission that Providence had given to the insurance commissioner saying, basically, we can exclude treatment for learning disability other than autism. They knew they couldn't exclude it for autism. They told the insurance commissioner they knew that, and yet they did it anyway. And the insurance commissioner also had testified a few years before to the legislature saying that they knew this was illegal and they had already prohibited other people from doing it. And yet they kept doing it and the insurance commissioner did not enforce. So we sued. Uh, what we did is uh, we, we got a couple of class action law firms together to pursue this issue in federal court. Uh, and I want to emphasize how horrifically expensive and difficult that is. I spent a couple of years looking for law firms that were willing to do this. No normal person can realistically afford an attorney to do this. The cost of this lawsuit was in excess of one and a half million dollars. Uh, the, the lawyers basically funded that themselves and they took it all on risk at the, for the risk of losing everything. But they did it because they believed that we had a very strong case and they thought it was a, a, a good, just, justifiable, worthy thing to do for their, their company and, and their firm. <clears throat> and I, you know, I had to bring them a list of more than 100 possible plaintiffs with different cases that we had worked through. And they basically, out of that list of 100, they picked the ones that were the, the strongest case that they thought they could win the most easily. And when we were in court, I'm quoting here from a document that Providence filed explaining his reason. And basically what Providence told the judge is that they, and, and they bragged about this essentially, that they did what they did because they wished to provoke a lawsuit. And that was their explanation. They said they, they did what they did, quote, to place these issues before the court because they wanted to be sued. That was their argument. Now, as we were working through this, um, you know, I told you previously, you know, the insurance commissioner had commissioned a white paper asking his staff to explain why they shouldn't do anything. We began to turn and persuade members of, of the government staff to say, you know what, I think these guys are really right. Can we do something? And so what I'm showing you here is an internal memorandum in which the staff recommended to the insurance commissioner that he use his own authority to declare this to be illegal and to require the coverage. Uh, and he refused, he, he rejected that, that recommendation, but he, they staff tried to get him to, to change. So as we were working through this lawsuit, we, we did go back to the legislature and we did finally get the legislature to, to pass the bill. It was extremely difficult. Uh, we had to get the insurance industry to agree to everything that we did. Uh, and the insurance industry put in, insisted on lots of requirements that were problematic. So one of them you see here, um, this, uh, yeah, this, uh, this section B here, it says, 
only care for individuals who begin treatment before nine years of age. So they wanted to completely exclude anybody who couldn't start therapy until they were nine years old or older. So if you have somebody perhaps who's an immigrant who is coming in, perhaps low income who didn't have access to good uh, diagnostic services and never realized they were autistic until they were nine years old or older, the insurance industry wanted to give them nothing and the legislature agreed to that. Uh, this bill did pass unanimously with those provisions in it. We objected. Uh, this, what you see here is the governor signing ceremony. You know, that's Governor Kitsaba there signing it. But it's even worse than what I just said because they actually postponed the implementation date. <clears throat> the, um, they, when this passed in 2013, they postponed it by a couple of years because under federal law at the time, if the legislature, Oregon legislature, adopted a new requirement that didn't already exist, then Oregon was still going to have to pay a, a large subsidy to insurance companies to pay for it. And if it was acknowledged that this was an existing benefit that was should have been covered all along, then the federal government was going to pay the same subsidy. Now, we had persuaded several government agencies, actually most of the agencies, at this point that we were right, that the law really already recovered covered this. So this is an email message from the head of the health exchange um, in Oregon to Matt Stainer, who I believe is in the governor's office and is CCing the governor of the insurance commissioner and the governor's chief of staff. Basically saying, yeah, we think they're right. We, we think this is already required for coverage. And part of the reason for it is that the government was based on a Pacific source insurance plan that we had already sued and had already beaten and had already gotten the court to order them to, to pay for this coverage. And this is, I think, one of the grossest email internal documents I have ever seen. This is an email message from the governor's chief of staff to the insurance commissioner. Um, summarizing a conversation with uh, the CEO of Pacific Source Insurance Plan, basically saying, hey, we're only covering this therapy because of, because of a lawsuit. We're only covering it because a federal judge told us we had to. That shouldn't really count. So because it's only because a federal judge told us we had to do it, that shouldn't count, and it should be considered a new mandate where the state has to pay us a subsidy. So the insurance commissioner at that point was beginning to come around and he wrote a message back to the governor's office basically saying, um, you know, I mean, I am terrified, we highlighted in yellow, they're giving consistent and, and contradictory information. Now they're saying they don't cover it at all. And I think the key thing, we would, in other circumstances, we would consider enforcement action against a carrier that takes this approach to a request for information. That's another way of the insurance commissioner saying that CEO lied to you. He's lying to us and that's illegal. <clears throat> and again, this documents all came out of public records requests from, from record. They didn't just hand it to me. Um, so we did get through court and we did get a federal judge to give us an extremely strong ruling finding that the insurer had violated both state and federal laws in denying access to this care. It was a very well-constructed decision. We won on two different Oregon statutes and a federal statute. Uh, and it was done on summary judgment, meaning that you know, there was no way, no rational trier of fact could possibly find in favor of the insurance company. <clears throat> Once we got that federal ruling, the whole world changed for us. Because up until that point, we had the governor fighting against us behind the scenes. We had the insurance commissioner unable to act because the governor was preventing, at this point, her, the new insurance commissioner, from acting. Uh, we had the insurers not collaborating. With that done, we suddenly had a massive media burst of, of positive news coverage with all sorts of journalists asking the governor and the insurance commissioner, what are you doing? And what came out of that are uh, two sort of sweeping bulletins and orders from the insurance commissioner, which essentially rewrote, or first off, ordered them to give us the coverage that we wanted for autism. <clears throat> but beyond that, ordered them, every insurer to reconsider 
every form of health, mental health care for every mental health condition on every insurance plan in the state to basically say, if it's medically necessary, you got to cover it, which is what the law had said all along, but they just weren't doing it. And the other thing, again, now five years later, the insurance commissioner, in addition to losing the lawsuit, the insurance commissioner fined Providence $100,000 for uh, their, their behavior, uh, which was pretty small, a, a large fine for Oregon, but still pretty small compared to what they had uh, suffered in court. So I think that the key messages here um, this was a lot of work. This was a huge amount of work. We had to do, we had to pass laws, multiple laws. We had to work with government agencies. We had to work with several, we actually had like three or four different lawsuits that we were doing simultaneously with different law firms. Uh, but we also really made some very big changes. Uh, we drastically changed and improved access to healthcare services for autism. We went beyond that in really changing the rules on all of mental health coverage in, in Oregon to really make it make it much much stronger. Uh, so that that was so, and you know we we did that really as grassroots people just coming in. Uh, before this started, I did not know my way around the Capitol building. Uh, I. I knew members of the legislature, but I, I really did not know how anything in anything worked. I think some key points that I would work with. Um, one is, you know, I personally am a Democrat. I'm a member of the Democratic Party, but every our our law was passed unanimously. We had very strong support from the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party. Uh, in some cases, we had obstacles put in by Democrats and Republicans helped us solve them, and obviously vice versa. And so most laws that are passed are actually passed unanimously or nearly unanimously. And so if you are working on an issue, work with everybody and work with everybody. Don't just you know, pick one party or the other, work with both sides. Um, that is definitely a key thing. Uh, you to get a bill started, you only need one legislator to get a law, the, the process started. There are 90 legislators in the building. If you talk to one legislator who says no, go find another one and keep trying. <clears throat> um, the capital runs on trust. It is extremely important that you should always tell the truth and be very careful with your facts. Uh, if you are speculating or guessing, make it clear, hey, I think this is true, but I'm not sure. If you don't know something, say, hey, I'll get back to you. By building a reputation for being honest and truthful, you gain trust and respect, and they will, they will listen to you. And if you lose that, you can never get it back. Um, always be on your, your best behavior and be collaborative with other people. Uh, I, I mentioned the difference between mice and lions. I'm a mouse, um, I have to behave well. There are rich and powerful people who do not behave well, and that's disappointing, but we have to work with it anyway. They can get away with behaviors and dishonesty and other kinds of things that we simply can't do. Uh, they can be rude, they can be aggressive. We have to be nice and friendly anyway. It's just, it's just the reality of the situation. Um, I think another, things can take time, uh, if you propose a bill or a rule that doesn't pass the first time, keep trying uh, and keep coming back. Uh, and you know, learn from learn from what happened and just keep going. Uh, the uh, I think you know, agencies are not monolithic. You know, like I mentioned in the story, initially we had a lot of opposition from the insurance commissioner by the end of this process they really liked us and they were big supporters but it took a whole lot of work to work through starting by finding individuals within the agency who supported us and reinforcing them and supporting them and and before the entire agency turned around <clears throat> um, i talked about public records and I, I showed you in this presentation a number of examples of um, in public documents. 
We have really good public records laws in the state where you can get access to just about anything. Uh, that includes internal email messages and documents. They will may have to redact. In some cases, they may ask you to pay a fee for their time. And so you, you need to be careful with and judicious with what you're asking for so it's, you don't have an unreasonable burden. But it is remarkable what you can dig up. And you know you have the legal right to that information. Um, another would be building broad coalitions. I think I have often found that keeping, keeping your friends and allies aligned and working together can be harder than working with the opposition because you, know, you have rivalries, you have people with different ideas, uh, you need to build, build as big a consensus as you can with, with friends and allies and, and keep them on board. Sometimes it means making compromises and sometimes it means pushing other people to accept compromises that they may not want to accept. Um, and I think just lastly, before we get into the, the question, just some kinds of things that are coming up. So one thing we're working on right now is Oregon's Medicaid waiver. So Oregon has a unique Medicaid system and every five years we have to get reauthorization for it. We're doing that now. Um, one, there are three issues that we have been working on. Uh, one of them, I use the acronym EPFDT involves uh, access to uh, um, healthcare for children. Under federal law, Medicaid must pay for all medically necessary care for any child under the age of 21. Oregon has been exempted from that for the last 30 years, meaning Oregon alone in the country has been allowed to withhold medically necessary care from children solely to save money, even if it's life-saving care. And we have been pushing to stop that, and I'm very happy that Oregon has agreed to stop it we need to make sure that they, they do it efficiently. Another one uh, is relating to what's called a quality or quality adjusted life year metric. Uh, this is something that um, when the Medi Medicaid make decisions about what to cover, uh, they, Oregon has been using what's called a quality adjusted life year metric where they discount the value of a person's life by the impact of their disability. So in essence, the life of a person with a disability is considered less valuable than the life of a person without disability. They were actually ordered not to do that 30 years ago by the federal government, and they have been doing it anyway. And in the latest uh, Medicaid waiver application, they have affirmed that they are wish to continue doing it. And so we are fighting against that. So we will fight with the, the Medicaid waiver with the federal agency and likely also back with the legislature next year uh, when it reconvenes to basically get a state law to, to stop it. Uh, I think I'm a little bit over time, so why don't we shift to questions? That's great, thank you. For the, pres for the presentation portion, so we will stop that again at the Q&A section. And with that, thank you so much for joining us, Nelly, and we'll pass it off to you. Okay, so before I start, um, what do I do for screen sharing purposes for my presentation? Um, it says only hosts can share and then all participants. Um, you are a co-host, so you should be able to... To share? Okay. Yeah. Share. Hopefully this, I can do that because it's not letting me uh, right now. Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, so most of my presentation is going to focus on the nitty gritty of how to build a coalition, what considerations to make, and I could I could try to get it up for you if you'd like. Yes, that would be that would be much uh, more appreciated. I I can't um, for some reason it's not letting me share my screen. I deleted uh -huh. some slides, but I can't. No problem. Sorry about this tech difficulty. We'll get mine's loading. Okay. There we are. Okay. So what I do at respectability is I um, 
look at educational issues and workforce issues to try to make the workforce of California more, more equitable and receptive to the needs of people with disabilities. Um, I'm working currently working with the LA County Workforce Board and the San Francisco Workforce Board and commenting on their plans on specific needs and specific programs that can target people with disabilities, specifically people with disabilities who have not yet earned their four-year degree. And most of my work has been in the workforce field and um, some benefits navigation, but most of my work um, at the governor, as a governor appointee and my previous work has been in workforce and coalition building to pass um, either specific bills or specific initiatives to start. Um, and I'm currently working on the building Better Futures Initiative for Respectability, which is focused on getting more people with disabilities into the workforce, specifically those who do not have a four-year college degree. And what that has uh, led me to was a lot of relationship building, number one. Um, next slide, please. So all these people, Stephen Hawking, Whoopi Goldberg, um, Demi Lovato, Selma Blair, all of them have disabilities and Marley Matlin. Um, next slide. Um, we can skip this slide. We know the difference. One of the biggest issues that, um, one of my biggest inspirations in this work is um, John Lewis. And um, I love this quote, democracy is not a state, it's an act. And it basically, Building coalitions is bringing voices together for a common goal. And how you define that is what determines who comes into this, into this uh, coalition. And uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, next slide. I, I had an edited version. This is the extended version. So I only have 10 minutes. Um, once again, next slide. So tools of advocacy, meeting with elected officials, making a phone call to an elected official, these are all different forms of engaging and trying to influence legislation and policy. Writing a letter to your representative, trust me, that has had a great impact when you have a coalition work a, work a letter with specific recommendations that say, I want this piece of regulation fixed, this piece of wording fixed, and these, particular ideas outlined in a letter, they literally take your letter and put it into, send it to the uh, ledge council and put it into language that um, can be put into a legislative bill. So building coalitions is number one. It's one of the most effective um, forms of, of legislative and community change. Next slide. Um, one of the key, well, it, I think that I, we can move on because this is a, the disability rights movement. Um, and I'm pretty sure based on the, the questions I've heard, um, you guys are well versed in the history. Um, another one, the key premise of my coalition work is based on, on this quote from Barack Obama, Barack Obama. If one individual can change themselves, the person can change a room. If he or she or they can change a room, they can change a city. If they can change a city, they can change a state. And if she, if he, they, and she change a state, they can change a country. It all starts with individual relationships. Next slide. Um, these are just uh, links. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation will be shared with you. These are uh, linked specifically to national and California uh, legislators. If you're ever doing California work, I'm the person to talk to. Uh, next slide. So coalition building and how to create leverage for advocacy. So these are, next slide, please. Coalitions can be short-term or long-term entities. It depends on how you define your goal for the coalition. For example, working for working, how workforce boards in California view people with disabilities in the workforce. Currently, California 
Thanks to our work and respectability, we're starting to comment on the actual workforce plans and integrating uh, accommodations, um, accommodation needs, as well as different kinds of entrepreneurial structures that can benefit people with disabilities in the workforce. So that's the kind of work that I've done in, um, in the workforce plan. Um, so the California workforce uh, plan outlines how money from the federal government is used to train and employ people with the California workforce. Unfortunately, working adults with disabilities are not part of the plan. Respectability wants to change that which is primarily most of my work. Next slide. So how, how do you start identifying who to put in your coalitions? Um, make sure that to identify people or organizations that are committed to the same goal. Um, be a credible, respectable member of the community. Have strong links with the community or with decision makers. And also, one of the things that, um, as an organization, you have to determine what you bring to the table that they don't have. For example, respectability, because they understand how to speak about diversity, inclusion, and equity through a disability lens. That's something that, I kid you not, out of the 45 workforce boards in California, none of them have a specified person that can tell them, this is how you literally integrate and recruit talented people with disabilities. So that's our, our biggest kind of chip in the game. And we approach people by saying, you know, um, this is great. You know, currently I'm working with the a AFL-CIO um, of California, trying to see how they understand the, uh, the community with disabilities. It's simple as raising awareness. You know, your first meeting has to be raising awareness and being able to offer of tone, offer a tone of not only being knowledgeable in the issue, but also willing to walk them through it. So building that relationship of trust, like the previous speaker uh, mentioned, is key, is key. Um, and being a person from the community or an ally of the community that can speak to a personal experience that links you that, to that community and also bring statistics that can really, and where do you get those statistics? Um, it's not in the presentation. There's a compendium. The University of New Hampshire has a disability compendium that has statistics on how many people with disabilities are actually working, how many people with disabilities are on government assistance, how many people with disabilities are there per state. Um, and it breaks it down by race. Um, I don't think it's done right now by class, but it breaks it down by 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 race and sex. Um, and we're, we're trying to change the compendium in order to be more inclusive and representative of intersectional identities. Um, like I said, have a special expertise that is complementary to helping achieve your goal. So when you look at a partner, you think, all right, are, are our mission or our goals aligned? Number, number one. Two, Are there services or are they representing constituencies that we didn't think about? For example, I'm reaching out to the spinal cord injury community who are severely affected by the lack of employment. So what I'm doing is basically going to United Spinal, one of the largest um, nonprofits that works with spinal cord injury um, persons and literally saying, okay, where can we work? You know, we want to work with you. You are part of our community, but we're not the experts in spinal cord injuries. We're here to work with you and add a different element, but you are the experts. And being willing to say that to a coalition member and also offer up what you bring to the table, be it, you know, what, what I bring to the table is a lot of a combination background also legislative experience and how to navigate Sacramento. Um, 
So it's being able to see how your interests align, what resources they bring to the table, and what uh, resources you bring to the table and seeing how that can go to the larger impact goal. Everything is defined by how you basically define your goal and strategically plan on how you want to achieve that goal. And as part of my strategic plan was literally outlining, or my strategic work plan uh, was outlining who are the big players in the community that are dealing with this specific issue of the workforce? You know, who usually is not in the room that uh, could be, you know, a new member and can also, business is usually not in the room. So what I've done is I've gone to the LA County Economic Development Corporation and said, we wanna create a pipeline for people with disabilities so that you have people who apply to your different jobs in tech, government contracting, or any other sector to be prepared to go into the workforce. And they're like, wait a minute, there's people with disabilities that are, have the qualifications and background and training to do this. And we're basically telling them, yes, we're trying to create that pipeline. And we also will have trainings with the California workforce boards that prepare them to be ready to go into the workforce. So bringing in the business component so that they start to understand how you function and the government entities you engage is a key component of trying to build a strong coalition. Look for those who usually are not engaged. Um, the, the, that was the last point. Have diverse sectors of knowledge that contribute to your goal. That was uh, an example of that. Next slide. Relationship building are at the core of developing a strong coalition. Of strong coalition. Deve uh, developing one-on-one -on -one relationships. You might think, gosh, you know, if I want to build a, a large coalition of 50, of 50 organizations, how am I going to be able to, to do one-on-one -on -one relationships with every single one of them? Honestly, it's not as hard as um, you might think. There's actions like, you know, setting aside a Zoom for 10 or 15 minutes, but before you even set that up, stay to your commitment. And if you're going to send them a document and you say that a certain date is is when you're going to send them the document, send it. And then when you when you have when you have other voices coming in from the coalition, you bring them together in a way that everyone's feedback is incorporated into the action steps so that they feel that their voices are being incorporated into, not only feel, but know that their voices are being incorporated into the plan. So, you know, um, I used to call it um, the woman, I used to have a neighbor who knew everybody's business, um, who knew who was going to college, who wasn't going to college, what, where they were working, who's getting married, who's having a child. There's always a specific person in the coalition that is connected to several spokes. So target those individuals, target the individuals that you know are one, knowledgeable about a particular sector you wanna engage in, you know? And, you know, uh, one of the key things that I was able to do in building relationships is there's two types of, of, of people when you're building coalitions. There's the transactional and then there's the transformational. Transactional is basically focused on um, getting agendas on time, making sure that the agenda items are, are, are along their interest. And it's very, it's very, I would say disconnected, but it's also an essential part of coalition building because you have to have all those uh, technical aspects run well. Transformational is when you literally sit down with the individual and within 20 minutes, I would say within five minutes, I know which, uh, how this person usually feels or thinks. How do I do that? I ask them key questions. It's like, what brought you to this work? You know, this is what we do. Um, 
what brought you to this work? That really unveils what motivates them. Then you bring in what motivates you in the work. And there's, there's this conversation that builds a bond. I'm not saying, you know, kumbaya, because there's moments where you will come across a person that isn't very talkative. So the next step would be, okay, if they're not very talkative, maybe they're a transactional person and they feel more empowered with being involved in actually building the process. So, um, you know, sharing values and mission are, are key, but it's knowing when to switch between those two individuals, the transactional and transformational individual. Uh, it's easier to gain commitment from a group or individual if they understand the goals of the coalition, the resources you offer, and the reason for being in the coalition with your personal values. That's key. Um, that's a summarized version of what I just said. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, recruit members that share the goal of employing people with disabilities using the workforce uh, workforce uh, work that I do. Common thread in workforce development. Enlist members' active support. So when you're meeting with them, either transactionally or having a real, you know, deep-hearted conversation, always gain a commitment from them. Something as simple as, would you, you know, would you go to me, would you bring two other people to this meeting that you feel supports our mission? You know, it, it's kind of enlisting them in building your coalition. It's making that commitment once you know that there's an actual relationship built there. And how does that, you know, once you have your initial conversation, it's following up with a phone call, literally calling them up and saying, just checking that you got all the materials that you're, you, you but just checking that you got all the materials that were sent, but also how are you doing? How's your kid? How's, you know, very quickly. It can be, oh, he's doing fine, but it's being able to be agile and being able to gain commitments from individuals. Oh, uh, next slide. Have a clear agenda. Remember, you are the facilitator. Um, always have an icebreaker with introductions. It, it, um, my favorite icebreaker is what is, what is your favorite book or what is your theme song if you ever had to have a theme song when you walk onto a stage. Um, leave room for discussion and be flexible if people have to change the agenda order. Uh, make sure that there's a note taker that's not part of the coalition. So bring someone from your staff so that the coalition members feel free and not obligated to all, you know, remember every detail. Um, you know, listen to the conversation and, it, and for possible themes that uh, arise during the conversation and make notes about them. Uh, discuss with coalition members if these themes are actually uh, correct. Um, kind of checking in with them, kind of an active listening, uh, kind of approach. De devise goals together with, co with coalition members for next steps. Like I said, the next steps is where you gain the commitment of when, uh, who's gonna step up to either lead a part or be part of a team to address the issue. Always remember to set a date for the next meeting. I can't tell you how many times we have a great conversation and the setting up of meetings happens maybe a week later instead of following doing it immediately after either through a doodle or through checking everyone's uh checking everyone's schedule have someone like an associate that you trust who's really good with details to take this over next slide uh, all right facilitator Okay, next slide. Okay, your story. This is my favorite part. It's being able to use part of your story. Next slide. Your individual story reflects values, reflects um, beliefs, and, and the it, it tells them what makes you tick. But being able to, next slide. 
So one of the key things that I use uh, to recruit members in the coalition building is a HUI uh, by Marshall Gans, who is a professor at Harvard. Um, literally, I'm, I'm currently using it for a campaign that I'm working on. Um, you go approach a person and you're like, you know, how do you feel about X? For example, how do you feel about people with disabilities being, having only, uh, excuse me, in California, there's 4 million working adults with disabilities and only 2 million are actually in the workforce. You know, what does that make you feel? <laughs> what, what, not what, you know, it can also be, you know, what's your reaction to that? Um, offer your idea or passion that would help address that issue. And then also putting a timeline and saying, we need to get this done and we need you to come and join us and we have a deadline. We have an actual project and we have an actual deadline. And that's why we need to do it now. Ask your audience to be part of the solution. Uh, next slide. Um, here's the example. People with disabilities are not considered value employees in the workforce system. Accessibility needs are not addressed. We want a chance like, we want a chance like everybody else. Hope. If you come together as a group slash coalition, we can show our united power to change the workforce system. Urgency. California is the eighth largest economy in the world with people with disabilities are left out of it. California is planning its workforce investment it, when they're planning the California workforce investment. Our actions as a coalition will impact the future of people with disabilities in California and the time to act is now. And then it's, you do the ask, will you join our coalition? Next slide. Um, a HUI works uh, when it comes to interpersonal messaging, educating elected officials, voter contact, volunteer recruitment, and it's e easily applicable to public speaking, uh, political literature and press releases. Next slide. Also, just wanted to do a little bit of a time check to leave some Q and A at the end. Okay. Um, so to have a win, you have to have specific steps, an achievable plan. I I hate I I used I used to work in government, and they always used to throw smart goals at me. Boy, does that work in coalition? Um, having a specific, achievable, measurable, and actionable steps, uh, I mean, time-based steps are key to actually moving a project forward and having meaningful impact. Next slide. I think um, I spoke about this already. So um, next, this is my favorite way. Values drive emotion, emotions drive action. That's key. If you can connect with someone at the emotional level, as well as making them feel the urgency of the cause, right away they're gonna ask, how can I get involved? Or you tell them, you know, would you like to help? This is what's going on. Um, it depends on the person's temperament. But I think I could answer more questions on, a, on the, on the um, I apologize for this being so quick. Um, my transportation, prevented me from being here earlier, but I can answer any questions if this is way too fast. So I'll stop here. Then we'll stop recording so folks um, have any questions.